Worth You're over listening to OTR FM, part of the Ion Radio Network. IPMNation.com. <laughs> Tonight on Unleashed, Trump is apparently still really mad at Megyn Kelly, so much so he's willing to sabotage his own campaign over it. At least, that's what it looks like. Very strange development. Speaking of developments, things go bad with the Oregon standoff, and I'm going to have to eat some crow on that one. And would you vote for a man who sacrifices a goat? We'll explore that a little bit. It is Tuesday, January 26, 2016, just after 11 p.m. from the Uptown Auto Repair Studio. This is Matt Connerton Unleashed, and it starts right now. Auto sequence starts. Welcome, 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 everybody. It's that time again. Matt Connerton Unleashed. Good to have you with me. We are broadcasting live from the Uptown Auto Repair Studio in Manchester, New Hampshire, on IPM Nation One. And, of course, every Tuesday and Thursday night, we also have the honor and privilege of being on Ohm Times Radio, specifically OTR-FM, the premium channel on Ohm Times Radio. So you can hear us five nights a week on IPM Nation One and uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays also on OTR-FM. And don't forget the television edition of Unleashed every Wednesday afternoon at 2 p.m. Eastern live on IPM Nation. And we do uh, get that up and available for you on demand on uh, both YouTube and Vimeo, usually by about about 9 p.m. Eastern on Wednesday. Because we do recognize that, uh, you know, at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, some of you are, I don't know, at work or at school or some crazy stuff like that. Um, <laughs> responsibilities. Uh, so, so you know, we do make that available for you to watch whenever you would like. So lots of exciting stuff. Um, let's see. I have, speaking of exciting stuff, well, here, let me, let me give out the contact info first. And then I have some, I, I do have some audio that I'm dying to play for you. But, uh, of course, if you would like to opine tonight during the program, you can call us. We do have a phone line open, 617-917-4IPM. That's IPM as an IPM nation. 617-417, I'm sorry, 617-917-4IPM. I swear to God, when I give that phone number, it's almost like I'm, I'm dyslexic because I keep wanting to put the four where the nine is. Isn't that, it's, it's so strange. And I know, I've noticed lately too, let me go off on a little tangent here. Something, something about myself that I've noticed just in the last couple of years. I, 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 I know that uh, dyslexia, we all know what dyslexia is. I don't have to explain it, but it's something that you're born with, right? You, you don't, it's not like it's something you develop. You're, you're born with dyslexia. dyslexia. You even, see, I can't even say, I, I, I'm, I'm mixing up the order of letters in the word dyslexia. I almost said dyslexia. Dyslexia. You, um... You know, it, so it's not something you just develop. You don't become dyslexic. But um, I've noticed in the last couple of years, now I'm not, you know, I'm not having any issues, of course, with reading or writing or anything like that, mixing up letters, because that's one of the things, you know, people who are dyslexic, they have difficulty learning to read. It, it takes them a bit longer, and, and it's something they struggle with because, you know, their mind wants to, wants to move the letters around and whatnot. And same thing with numbers. Now, I, I'm, I, I've never had an issue with that, but I've noticed just in the last couple of years, I swear it's like there's, there's just words where I'll, I'll move the syllables around in my mind as I'm saying them. Um, like a couple minutes ago, the word dyslexia, I almost said dyslexia. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a strange thing, and I, I don't think it means anything. I don't think, like I said, I don't think you become dyslexic. I don't think it's that. I hope it's not something neurological 
that's happening to me. Um, I think what it is is I just get excited for the show because it only happens when I'm on the air. It doesn't happen in regular conversation. So I think I just get worked up and excited about becoming unleashed during the show. And I just and, and so my my mouth begins to go faster than my brain wants it to. So things come out wrong. At least I hope that's what it is. I hope there's not something wrong with me neurologically. I don't think there is. But uh, but it's something I've just noticed about myself in the last couple of years. Uh, recently on the show, and I know because I, I heard from a couple of listeners about this who noticed it, I was having trouble um, a couple weeks ago. Uh, Jen and I went to this um, forum uh, hosted by John Stossel here in Manchester, New Hampshire, uh, right downtown at the, the Radisson Hotel about uh, civil asset forfeiture. And I was having trouble saying it during the show. It, it, it came, I did it a couple of times, actually. I said, what did I say? C- civil forfeit assature. <laughs> civil forfeit assature instead of civil asset forfeiture. I said civil forfeit assature, which is, uh, you know, what is that? <laughs> you know, that almost sounds like, uh, like some sort of illness, like, you know. Uh, something you don't want to hear. I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Connerton, you have civil forfeit assature. Oh, no, what's that? Well, let's just say you might want to get used to standing up more. So, uh, I don't know. It's just something I've noticed. And, but I, I do it with that damn phone number. I'm giving out the phone number. And it's, see, if I stop and think about it, it's fine. I can do it. 617-917-4IPM or 4476 if you prefer. But uh, but if I say it fast, I end up putting a four where the nine goes. I don't know. Maybe I just need to concentrate more on what I'm doing and just slow down and let my brain catch up to my mouth. But anyway, that's the phone number that you can call or you can text if you're too shy to call. 617-917-4476. That's the hotline here at IPM Nation at the Uptown Auto Repair Studio. And let's see. Uh, also, of course, if you're at ipmnation.com slash live one, we have our fancy chat room, which you can also use. You can also tweet me or follow me on Twitter at Matt Connerton. And of course, uh, the Facebook page for Matt Connerton Unleashed. Please like the page if you haven't done so already. I would appreciate it. Like all the pages, like the IPM Nation page, like the Ohm Times radio page, please. Uh, it's, um, you know, it, it, it just, uh, it makes us feel good. It makes us feel appreciated when you do that. So even if you don't listen to the show, well, of course <laughs> that doesn't make sense because if you didn't listen to the show, you wouldn't hear me begging you to like all these pages now, would you? So, boy, maybe there is something wrong with me neurologically. Anyway. Okay. Speaking of things wrong with people neurologically. All right. I have some audio to play for you. The audio speaks for itself. So I'm going to go ahead and play this. Now, it's, you know, only about a minute, uh, about about a minute and a half. And then uh, this is from uh, a local affiliate in Orlando, Florida, Fox 35, from their uh, Fox 35 news news, uh, uh, program. And listen, by the way, now, it's from Florida. So... (laughs) A lot of crazy things. They were talking about that on a, on a show, uh, Free Talk Live, recently, about how you always hear about Florida man. You know, a Florida man is accused of, or a Florida man did this insane thing. Years ago on Loveline, a uh, syndicated show that some of you may have heard, they used to play this game called Germany or Florida, where they would give you a, a, just an insane news story, and callers would have to guess, okay, did this happen in Germany or Florida? Anyway, let me just... I'm just going to go ahead and play this for you. Take a listen. Fox 35 at the Orlando Center. This is Orlando News Now. Okay, this next story really got our attention today. I know you guys are working on this. A libertarian candidate for Florida's U.S. Senate seat goes by the name of Augustus Sol Invictus. So he yeah, says he walked a- from Florida to the Mojave Desert. That's unusual, but this story gets even more unusual. How so, John? Yeah, this is a wild story. It's on our, our website right now on OrlandoSentinel.com, but... This, this man, Augustus Sol Invictus, said that after he did this walk, he, I'm going to get this right, he drank goat's blood, and it was a goat that he actually killed. It was part of a sacrifice, and his quote to the Associated Press was, I sacrificed the animal to the god of the wilderness. Yes, I drank the goat's blood. Florida, U.S. Wow. Senate candidate. 
And I know the Libertarian Party is now trying to, uh, to distance themselves a little bit from this guy saying, OK, this is not fully what we stand for. But, uh, man, see, I, of course, again, only in Florida do you get a guy who says, yeah, I drank a goat's blood. By the way, I'm a candidate for U.S. Senate. Yeah, like you said, the chairman, the former chairman of the Libertarian Party, Adrian Wiley, who, if you remember, he ran for governor against Rick Scott. And uh, obviously, Adrian Wiley lost. He only got about 3% of the vote. But he resigned his post as chairman of the Libertarian Party, sort of in response to this Invictus getting the, getting the nod to go ahead with his candidacy. And so the chairman, or former chairman Wiley said that Invictus wants to recruit neo-Nazis to the party. He wants to start a civil war. And he has all these other platforms that uh, Mr. Wiley doesn't agree with. You can catch Orlando News Now every weekday on OrlandoSentinel.com. Oh, that's good to know. Um, okay, so <laughs> probably didn't need the last part of that audio, but yeah, there you have it. Only in Florida. <laughs> it's funny that uh, that the newscasters there, or one of them is the newscaster and the other um, works for the, the uh, Orlando Sentinel, uh, the, the local paper there, but it's funny that they're, they're <laughs> even they kind of had this attitude like only in Florida. Like even the the local news media there seems to uh, embrace the reputation that Florida has and the crazy shenanigans of of uh, Florida man <laughs> who we hear about. Oh boy, um, I have something to say about this, but uh, I will save it for after the break because we have to take a very quick break, and then I, I have a I have a comment to make. And then on that story, and then we'll come back and talk about some other stuff. More Unleashed, we're live on IPM Nation 1 and OTRFM from the Uptown Auto Repair Studio. Don't go away. The Real Conscious Connection. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. This is Terry Van Horn, and I want to invite you to join me for my weekly radio show, Hailing Light, on Own Times Radio, every Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Hailing Light, we want to bring love, light, and blessings into your world. You can find out more about us at www.healinglightonline.com. Blessings. Join Elliot Jolish, the business therapist, each Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern for the Elliot Jolish Hour as he interviews business experts on your behalf. And you're invited to email your business questions to questions at ecjgroup.com for answers live on air every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Eastern on the Elliot Jolish Hour. Ohm Times Magazine is one of the leading online content providers of positivity wellness, and personal empowerment. A philanthropic organization, their net proceeds are funneled to support worldwide charity initiatives via Humanity Healing International. Through their commitment to creating community and providing conscious content, they aspire to uplift humanity on a global scale. Ohm Times, co-creating a more conscious lifestyle. Welcome back, everybody. Matt Connerton Unleashed. We're live on OTRFM and IPM Nation One on this glorious Tuesday evening. I say glorious because it's actually uh, really warm out here in the Northeast. It's quite wonderful. I do love El Nino. Uh, for, for those who don't know, or if you're in another part of the country so you don't pay much attention, uh, El Nino, uh, of course, the weather system that uh, that we get. I don't know how often we get it every few years. I don't know. Um, historically, for whatever reason, uh, the way it tends to affect the weather in the Northeast 
is, uh, and of course, uh, you know, I'm in Manchester, New Hampshire right now, is we tend to get mild. It, it tends to give us a mild winter, which is wonderful because last winter here in the Northeast, particularly in New Hampshire, where I am, sucked quite a bit. <laughs> it was probably one of the worst winters I can remember ever. Uh, just endless, just one snowstorm after another, big storms, and it was brutally cold. Yeah, uh, we fell into a deep freeze in December and it stayed that way. It was awful. This winter thus far, we're almost to the end of January. We've had one minor snowstorm and it's been pretty mild overall. A couple cold days here and there, but overall it's been nice. Oh, I love it. We earned it. So I know I know that uh, on IPM Nation, our biggest concentration of listeners is in the Manchester uh, New York and Boston markets. So uh, you all know what I'm talking about. Oh, actually, no. I'm sorry. That was insensitive of me. In New York City, no, you don't know what I'm talking about because you just got two feet of snow dumped on you. I apologize. Um, I don't know if Boston got any of that snow, but that that storm completely missed us up here. But again, we earned it. We deserve a reprieve. Uh, if anyone would like to call in tonight during the live show, you can. 617-9174-IPM, 617-9174-476. You can call or text at that number. Dave Ridley, if you're listening, I promise I'm ready for you this time. If you call, I'll get you on the air immediately. I've I've worked out all the bugs. <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Uh, the, the, okay, really quick, and then I've, I've got a bunch of, I, I've got a lot I want to get to tonight, but really quick. So this guy, Invictus whatever, from uh, Florida, the Florida man, <laughs> who uh, the candidate for Senate, who, who libertarian, um, drank his own blood. And, and by the way, for, first of all, uh, as someone who's kind of a libertarian myself, it's not helpful uh, to those of us who, with, with our particular worldview or political view, when people who identify themselves as libertarians uh, behave in an insane manner. Because there are people, uh, both Republicans and Democrats, who unfortunately view libertarians as crazy already. So this doesn't help. I don't. I don't like this kind of story. Uh, but it's so bizarre. I had to. I had to read it. I actually first heard about it listening to Free Talk Live. Uh, uh, those guys, Ian and Daryl, they were talking about it earlier. Um, Will Coley, host of um, of uh, a Call for Freedom, and he's from the organization Muslims for Liberty. Uh, which, by the way, uh, you can hear that show uh, on uh, IPM Nation 1 on Sunday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern, right after Free Talk Live, uh, Will Coley's show, Call to Freedom. But he called in and was talking about um, sacrificing goats. But, um, but, uh, but, you know, he does it to eat the goat. See, I don't have a problem with this stuff. I don't have a problem with um, killing an animal, to be blunt about it, uh, if you intend to eat it afterward. You know, they are part of the food chain. You know, so I'm not I'm not anti hunting or any of that. I understand it. I'm a meat eater. So, well, I personally could never kill an animal. I mean, I personally I'll, I'll be completely honest with you. Going out into the woods with a gun and shooting a beautiful animal like a deer, I couldn't do it. But I make no judgments about anyone else who does it. They're part of the food chain. Plus, it's it's important for the management of the, the species to, you know, if you don't if you don't kill some of them and eat them, they starve. Um you know, so I, I get all that. But I have to tell you, though, somebody like this guy, Invictus, whatever, I don't even remember the rest of his name. I already closed out the article. Um, he drank the blood because it's part of his so-called religion. He killed the goat, drank the blood. There's nothing in there about him eating the goat. Now, I would like to know if he ate the goat, because if he ate the goat, I'm fine with it. But if he killed the goat specifically to drink its blood and that's it, then I've got a big problem with it uh, because he killed the defense. If, if he killed a defenseless animal just to do something as, and by the way, that can't be ter terribly healthy uh, drinking uh, the blood of an animal. That just sounds like a bad idea. But if, if all he did, if basically what I'm saying is if he just killed the animal to perform this stupid ritual that I do have a problem with, I have a problem with organized religion of any kind where uh, others are harmed for no good reason, whether it be, you know, uh, Christians who think that they have a right to 
uh, tell people who they can or can't marry, or whether it be some freak who uh, wants to kill a goat and drink its blood. Now, I know I've, I've probably just offended all of my Christian listeners who are going, wait a minute, you're equating the two? Uh, yes and no. Um, obviously, the blood drinking thing is pretty freaky. Uh, but, I mean, it sounds almost more like a satanic thing, really, killing a goat and drinking its blood. But um, but it, it, it's, it's a broader point that I'm making. I have a problem with when organized religion infringes on the rights or the safety of anyone else. And I, and you know, you might say, well, Matt, you're talking about a goat. Well, here's the thing. I love animals. You know, they are sentient beings. You know, I have two cats, love them very much. Um, I don't like to see animals harmed. Now, again, I'm not making a judgment about killing an animal for food. Uh, You know, I eat meat. I would be a hypocrite if I were to make those judgments. Okay. I'm not a member of PETA, I'm not going to sit here and lecture you about how I don't like the way cows are raised. And, you know, I'm not that's that's not my thing. I'm not going to throw fake blood on your fur coat just to prove a point. But but I do have a problem with an animal being, quote unquote, sacrificed for some stupid ritual. Look, that I that I do have a problem with that goat didn't need to die. Now, again, if he ate the goat after he drank the blood or maybe he ate the goat and then drank the blood to wash down the goat. That's actually okay with me, but there's nothing in the article about him eating the goat. It just says he drank its blood. If he just did it to drink its blood, then that sucks because there was no reason to kill that animal. And I have a problem with that. And uh, on behalf of those of us who are rational, logical, sensible people, uh, please don't do that <laughs> because if if you're going to kill an animal just to kill it because you have imagined that it does some spiritual thing, the act of murdering that animal, you're just an a-hole. All right. Uh, quickly, I hadn't planned on talking about this, but this is interesting because it relates to a story. You know, uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz, head of the Democratic National Committee, has been taking some criticism because she very suspiciously has been making sure that these Democratic debates with Hillary Clinton, Bernie Sanders and Martin O'Malley have been taking place at times when virtually no one would be watching. There were two in a row that were on Saturday nights, uh, thus assuring they would have a very small audience. And then on the weekend of the Martin Luther King holiday, there was a debate scheduled on a Sunday night. Now, the Republican debates are all on days and times where they're going to get a lot of viewers. But there's been a lot of suspicion that Schultz has been doing this intentionally to protect Hillary by not allowing Bernie Sanders and Martin O'Malley exposure within the format of the debate. It helps to protect Hillary. And look, obviously, that's what she's doing. We're all onto it. She denies it. She's a liar. She's a she's a hack. She always has been. I've never liked her. But this is interesting. This popped up on Politico. Says here, MSNBC and union leader team up for unsanctioned Democratic debate. Listen to this. Um, The Democratic debate schedule appeared to be upended on Tuesday by the addition of an unsanctioned MSNBC and New Hampshire union leader debate scheduled for February. But the DNC responded hours later by saying it had no plans to sanction it, throwing into question whether Hillary Clinton or Bernie Sanders would attend. The debate, moderated by Meet the Press anchor Chuck Todd and MSNBC host Rachel Maddow, is set to take place February 4th and would be the only debate between the Iowa caucus and before primary voting in New Hampshire on February 9th, the newspaper announced. Uh, Joe McQuaid, president and publisher of the Union Leader, said in a statement, quote, our readers have demanded a debate to help them see who is the most fit to be the Democratic nominee for president. We were concerned that this would have been the first time in 32 years without a Democratic debate before the New Hampshire primary. We are glad to partner with MSNBC to ensure Granite Staters have the information they need to make a critical decision on February 9th, unquote. But a few hours later, the DNC countered with a statement from Chairwoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, of course. And here's what her statement says, quote, 
Our next DNC-sanctioned debate featuring our major candidates will be held in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, hosted by PBS on February 11th, with another already scheduled for March 9th with Univision and The Washington Post. We have no plans to sanction any further debates before the upcoming First in the Nation caucuses and primary, but we'll re, uh, reconvene with our campaigns after those two contests to review our schedule, unquote. That statement landed minutes after Clinton's communications director, Jeffrey Palmieri, said the frontrunner would be happy to participate in the proposed debate if the other candidates joined, thereby allowing it to be sanctioned. But with no prospects of such a sanction and no commitment yet from Sanders, it seems unlikely that the front runner Clinton would participate, even though members of her team have recently warmed to the idea of holding more debates after being opposed to the idea at first. Sanders is the one candidate who has not indicated any willingness to participate. The move comes as the Democratic National Committee has faced withering criticisms over their debate schedule, with just six debates three of which were scheduled over weekends and after months of pressure from local Democrats who have urged the DNC to add more debates. There's more to this article, and we're going to hit the next break. If you want to read the rest of it, it's in the media section on Politico. Uh, you can take a gander at that. But uh, but basically, uh, you know, there's, I mean, look, the fact that the DNC, under the direction of Debbie Wasserman Schultz, has only got six official debates scheduled during the primary season. I mean, that's abysmal. And clearly, clearly the idea is to protect Hillary Clinton. Why else would they do that? Protect her so that uh, in, in, in the sense that Sanders gets less exposure. And you see, because Sanders, during the debates, I keep saying, he keeps one-upping Hillary Clinton. Consistently, he's very, very good at that. So we know what's going on here. You know, we're not fooled. We got to take another break. We're only halfway done. So stick with me. More Unleashed coming up. Don't go away. The Real Conscious Connection. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Host your show on IOM FM, the radio network of Ohm Times Media, one of the more recognized brand names in the conscious community, and is backed by the extensive marketing reach of Ohm Times. Hosting a show on IOM FM immediately connects you with our extensive, dedicated community. Hi, this is Sylvia Henderson, Intuitive Life Coach and Energy Healer. Are you ready to elevate and rise way above your normal? Be sure to listen to my show, Intuitive Transformations, on Own Times Radio, Sunday evenings at 9 p.m. Eastern. Get the inspiration you need to transform your life. Hello, I'm Sandy Sedgmere host of the Inspired Parenting Radio Show, where every week we bring you empowering information from the diverse fields of conscious parenting, education, neuroscience, consciousness, health, and metaphysics to support you in nurturing the best in your children. So if you're interested in understanding what shapes your children's minds, spirits, and hearts, join me every Thursday at 4 p.m. Pacific Time, 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and prepare to be inspired. Have you ever wondered how to change your love paradigm? The secret key is finding a love partnership, not just a regular connection. How do you find these? Through conscious relationships. Ascending Hearts Dating is a dating site for people like you that believes in second chances and a different type of spiritual connection. Try Ascending Hearts for free today at AscendingHearts.com and change your love paradigm. Ascending Hearts, the premier dating community for the spiritually awake. Welcome back, everybody. Matt Connerton Unleashed. We are live. I just heard from uh, Dave Ridley. He's going to be calling in shortly. Dave Ridley, of course, from the Ridley Report. So, Dave, I'm ready for your call. Uh, 
I mean, you know, whenever you're, whenever you're ready, of course, I'm just I'm not trying to rush you. I'm just saying that, uh, I think I can pull it off this time. Uh, it's kind of a running joke for, for anyone who, uh, who doesn't know it, it, there's been this, um, strange pattern. I was joking that it's like, we're jinxed. Uh, whenever Dave Ridley calls, uh, something goes wrong, uh, technically here in the studio and, and it ends up, uh, being a process to get Dave on <laughs> just because something, something just goes wrong, but I'm determined tonight. Nothing will go wrong. Um, let's see. So Trump, apparently is not participating. Speaking of debates, we'll stick with our debate theme for the moment. Uh, Trump says he's definitely not participating in the last GOP debate before Iowa. Um, He's now we'll see. We'll see if this holds. Apparently it's another Fox debate and Trump is still mad at Megyn Kelly and doesn't believe that Megyn Kelly will give him a fair shake. Uh, So he's saying, nope, I'm just not going to be there for this one. Now, he's made threats like this before and then didn't stick to them. He, he's caved. This is not new. This is not the first time he's made a threat like this, but it is new in that it sounds like he, he's pretty firm this time. He's not saying maybe. He's saying, I'm not going to be there. So this is the latest update. This is on HuffPost. Um, it says here, the GOP presidential candidates will face off Thursday In their final debate before next week's Iowa caucuses, this time without Donald Trump, Fox News, which is hosting the event, announced on Tuesday which candidates made the cut for the primetime debate, which will begin at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Trump's campaign manager, Corey uh, Lewandowski, confirmed to The Washington Post on Tuesday that the GOP frontrunner is definitely not participating in the Fox News debate. His exact words. In a statement, the campaign announced that Trump will hold his own separate event in Iowa to raise money for wounded veterans. The campaign said, quote, like running for office as an extremely successful person, this takes guts, and it is the kind of mentality our country needs in order to make America great again? What does that mean? This this takes guts? I don't... I don't understand the meaning of that statement. Skipping the debate takes guts because he knows there's going to be a political backlash for it. I I don't get it. Uh, Fox News issued a statement on Tuesday night that blasted the Trump campaign for making ridiculous ultimatums and threatening the reputation of anger and debate monitor, uh, monitor, 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 moderator, Megyn Kelly. Uh, Let's see. Here's the uh, here's the statement. Oh, actually, Dave's calling in. Dave Ridley, is that you, sir? It would be. Welcome to Matt Connerton Unleashed. And how about that? This is a first. You called. I answered. No problems. I think if I do if there's a pattern, it's easier to do things that are in a pattern, right? <laughs> I think you're right. Yes. <laughs> so. Is, is, is your show like Free Talk Live where I'm allowed to call in and change the subject? Absolutely, Dave. Absolutely. Please. What would okay, you like so, to talk about? So, you know, the way I look at it, if, if we're talking about them, they're winning. So I'm going to try to take some uh, attention off those fascistic presidential candidates. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, I have a piece of news that uh, is one of those things that's like it's, it's under the mainstream press radar, and it's also probably going to be under the, the Free Talk Live and Ridley Report radar. Um, so it's just not going to get reported anywhere else, but it's still Ooh. pretty interesting. Okay. The, um, do you know who Harriet Katie is? Harriet Katie? Yeah. No, I don't know that name. She must be. I think I read somewhere that she was 91 years old. Uh, she looks, looks like she's in her 70s, but she's a former state rep in New Hampshire. Yeah, there's, I, there's a lot of old old people in the, uh, in the <laughs> state legislature, that's for sure. <laughs> so uh, I think she holds a minor position in her town, Deerfield. Okay. Um, but she's very active on uh, talk radio, Facebook, and so forth, and uh, e- you know, email lists, uh, and uh, you know, just spreading the word about what's going on in her town. She was once, the most interesting thing about her is that if she was once, I guess in 2011, uh, raided by the Deerfield Police Department to seize her uh, recording equipment, probably a camera, uh, because she had recorded uh, in town hall. No kidding. 
I kid you not, I think it's probably the only time I can think of in New Hampshire history that I know of where a person has been uh, arrested for recording video in a town hall. Now, Gary Ian was, uh, he had his equipment confiscated once yeah. for, for, for allegedly recording in town hall. There was no actual proof that he had done that. But the, the evidence was that he had gotten too many of his facts right. <laughs> When he when when you reported the incident, now we talked we talked about Gary Dean when I called yesterday, didn't we? Yeah, we did. Yeah, yeah. But you he's say a little bit like he's a little bit like me. He's like a he's like a less frequent version of the Ridley Report, if that makes sense. But it, but in her case, now you said the police actually raided her home. I kid you not. That's stunning. I I don't know. I shouldn't be surprised. Well, I, but... she she claimed that they that they did. I yeah. think I probably verified that in 2011, but I don't really remember doing that. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I can't remember talking to the police about it, right, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Or emailing them about it. But, but I may have independently checked it out or, or something. I just don't remember so long ago. But um, uh, but she did. I, we, she and I did talk about that incident recently. Um, and she named the police that did it and everything. But, uh, but again, yeah, that was the 2011 incident. And I'm, uh, you know, I follow what she's doing recently, too. And um, a lot of it is a little bit complicated, and so it doesn't make some very good reporting. Uh, it doesn't make some very good stories. But uh, what, she, what she reported today uh, in a mass email was in, very interesting and pretty simple. She says, quote, uh, at tonight's selectmen's meeting, Deerfield, the NH Municipal Association asked for the selectmen to write the judiciary supporting House Bill 1611. I state that this is compelled speech since I have to pay both the New Hampshire Municipal Association dues and they're having staff write letters and mail, et cetera, mm-hmm. unquote. So, so what you're saying is, there, 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 this, are you familiar with the New Hampshire Municipal Association? Not really. I mean, I, I kind of, I know what it is, but I don't, I don't know much about how it works or anything. So it's one of these quasi-governmental organizations uh, that's just non-governmental enough uh, to be confusing, and uh, <laughs> is in regards to its status and uh, you know access and so forth uh, to their building. I've been in their building to protest once, although it's so confusing that I don't even know if the name or the building is consistent. Like they used to call it, they used to have a thing called local government center. Maybe they still do. It was associated with the New Hampshire Municipal Association. The two were, I think, in the same building, but I get confused as to who works for which and which. Is what. And I think that's by design, right? Oh, definitely. Uh, you know, yeah. I mean, bureaucracy by its nature, I think, is designed to be confusing to uh, to intimidate those of us who may try to challenge it. If I were to sum it up, I would probably say that it is a quasi-governmental organization or maybe even a non-governmental organization that is oriented toward helping towns be more powerful, town governments. Does that make sense? It does, yeah. <laughs> uh, so it, may, it, it will tend to guide them through imminent domain issues sometimes uh, or uh, to help them avoid legal minefields. Uh, sometimes their people will write editorials advocating uh or eminent domain, uh, you know, it's, it's big government, pro-government stuff. Uh, their guy, Cal, I think it's Calvin Johnson, if I recall. It's, it's, I'm not positive I remember his exact name. I may have the first or last name wrong there, uh, but their guy is very recognizable at the State House. I can't remember any time I've been to the State House, you know, when it's when it's busy and he's not there, right? Yeah. Um, so they're, they're, they're very active, and uh, they get money from governments to help governments. Uh, so it's really, ultimately, I'm probably paying his salary. <laughs> uh, he's not a terrible guy, you know, in terms of demeanor and stuff like that. You know, uh, uh, he was the one that approached me when I protested inside the building in 2006. And you know, he, he was fairly laid back about it. Um, I used to do this thing I called silent protests, where I just carry a sign into a building, and just yeah. stand there until they kick me out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, usually, I would have a I would have a flyer, so I didn't have to say anything. I just hand them the flyer, you know. Oh, paper, okay. List list my grievances, and then I would just report what happened. You know, write the text down of what happened and put that in the matrix. That's all pre pre Ridley report, but yeah. Um, he eventually kicked me out, uh, but he, you know he wasn't mean, and and every time I've talked to him, he's answered my questions. So he's just sort of he's sufficiently slippery 
in a charming sort of way that it's kind of kind of difficult to just walk up to them and ambush interview them. It's hard to know exactly what they're doing uh, to get mad about. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, he has he has told me to his credit that I think we're allowed uh, the citizens are allowed to attend meetings at the local government center building, right? Um, so I don't think it's super closed off. Um, but uh, but they're definitely a controversial organization in New Hampshire, hmm. and not as controversial as they should be because people have difficulty understanding what they're doing. Right, right. Yeah, and and I think that's I think that's true with a lot of organizations like that. Those sort of, as you put it, you know, quasi governmental organizations where you know where, where the the people who are running them aren't even. Uh, you know, oftentimes aren't even elected officials of any kind. They're just bureaucrats who are appointed to these positions, and then so they're they're not accountable well, to anybody. Oh, in in Johnson's case, I don't think he's even a bureaucrat uh, technically. I mean, he may have been one in the past, or maybe he is a bureaucrat concurrently to his duties with the uh, with uh, the municipal association. But um, but he he may not be considered officially a government worker or yeah. a government official. Yeah. Huh. Just, just by being with the NHMA wouldn't make him one, I don't think. Okay, <laughs> right. But um, anyway, the point is that they're they're not just pushing. I mean, you would think that they would be focused on pushing um, just uh, you know legislation that helps town governments or uh, pushing to help town governments be more capable or powerful against the people or something. Like that you'd think they would be focused mostly on that. But when I, when I looked at the House Bill sixteen eleven, that they're 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 pushing this this uh, this town town uh, board I guess the board of selectmen or aldermen to support sixteen eleven. Sixteen eleven doesn't have anything to do with the the, uh, the New Hampshire Municipal Association, uh, uh, you know, general mission of helping towns be more powerful. Not, not directly anyway. It's it's just a drug bill. It's a, it's a uh, it bans bath salt. Really? It's just, a, it's just a restriction on. It's just a direct restriction on my freedom and yours. It's not even. It's not even dealing with town process. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's that's, that's like, really that's all it is. That's all it addresses. Yeah. The only thing I can think. I just went. And, I didn't read the whole bill, but I did skim it. And um, you have a whole. Uh, the whole mission of the bill is seems. The Real Conscious Connection, Ohm Times Radio, IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Ohm Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Ohm Times endeavor. Host your show with Ohm Times Radio Network. Matt Connerton here. Join Jen Coffee and I twice a week for Matt Connerton Unleashed, a political talk show that's a little different than what you're used to. No liberal or conservative agenda here, just an honest dialogue about truth and how things really work in the world of politics. Matt Connerton Unleashed, every Tuesday and Thursday night at 11 p.m. Eastern on Ohm Times Radio. The name is Bond. James Bond. No, the name is Joe, the Joe Show. And we are returning back for our ninth season here on Old Times Radio. <laughs> so tune in every Wednesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific, on oldtimes.com slash mobile. You can take us wherever you go. Yeah! The number one reason girls drop out of school in sub-Saharan Africa is lack of access to feminine hygiene products. The Pads for School Girls Project, an outreach of Humanity Healing International, is changing this paradigm by setting up sewing programs at schools, teaching girls a vocational skill, while producing the reusable pads that help keep them attending classes. The girls pay it forward by making and giving pad kits to other girls in need. To learn more, visit HumanityHealing.org. Humanity Healing is where your heart is. Um, sorry, I'm just, uh, 
Hold on, there's some audio I should be hearing that I'm not hearing. That's strange. Okay, um, now are you hearing are you hearing me all right? Am I breaking up at all? No, I'm hearing you, but there's something else I should be hearing that I'm not. So you want me to fill the gap here? I can I can play guest host for the next five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it's 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 okay. We'll keep going. I I think we're I think we're good. So what else? Um, what else have you been? Uh, what else have you been working on this week? Oh, I haven't really shot anything new. I mean, I talked to you yesterday. I haven't shot anything since then. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. I haven't true. shot anything since uh, it's, uh, it's January eighth. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> I'm um, I'm working. I guess the next uh, scheme is going to be uh, the uh, working primary day and the day before, trying to see how much uh, crazy behavior I can capture on camera. Um, did you hear, I, I was talking about it earlier on the show. Did you hear there may be a, apparently you might get an opportunity if it works out, there might be a debate an unsanctioned, uh, debate, uh, for the, for the Democrats here in New Hampshire is sponsored by MSNBC and the union leader. Well, it sounds fairly sanctioned actually, if it's got those two in it. Well, the thing is though, the, uh, the democratic national committee, because if you notice, uh, with their debates so far, they've all been on, uh, two of them were on Saturday nights. And then this last one was on a Sunday night on Martin Luther King weekend. And, uh, so, uh, you know, and the union leader has been excluded from everything. They haven't had a chance to uh, participate in a debate. So this would be outside of the auspices of the democratic national committee, because they're the ones scheduling the debates and apparently MSNBC and the union, le- union leader have teamed up to try to convince the uh, campaigns. And it sounds like they're all in except the Sanders campaign. They haven't agreed to it yet, but if they agreed to it, then this will be, th- this will be an unofficial, unsanctioned debate. It'll be MSNBC and, U- and the union leader without the Democratic National Committee involved, which I think is great. You know, If they're going to keep trying to schedule these debates on nights when no one's going to watch them, and they only, yeah. and they only scheduled why six should, of them, which why is strange. The government- you know, people be able to sanction and unsanction debates that that I mean, that should be completely independent of them. Uh, uh, so yeah, it, it looks like we've got a perfect storm here where the authorities have overplayed their hand and gotten themselves into a situation where the debates are falling out of their control. Maybe that's what's happening. I hope so. Yeah, because they only scheduled six, which is really light for the primary season. I mean, uh, you know. I I don't know how many uh, the Republicans have scheduled, uh, but I'm sure it's more than six. And then apparently Trump isn't participating in, in this uh, next debate coming up. But but so hopefully this this debate uh, happens uh, that there is this debate here in New Hampshire before the the New Hampshire primary, and you know and that'll give um, you know that'll give obviously voters here more access to the candidates, and it, it might uh, give you an opportunity for some more of those interviews, you know, on uh, on debate day if if it happens. I hope it works out. Yeah. Well, it's, you know, I mean, the, I, I remember when I first moved here, I, I was kind of thinking, uh, I wish the answer was not host to the primary because it's going to make it harder to, to sort of liberate the state. You know, it's just too important. The, the authorities will fight too hard for it because the state is so much more important than, say, Wyoming, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, over the years, I have come to see there are certain advantages to having a primary here. There definitely was helpful when Ron Paul was on the scene. I think the the, pri- the fact that the primary was here in- indirectly resulted in people, you know, eventually moving here because they learned about us through their primary activities. That's <laughs> that's interesting. Hand, I wouldn't have thought of that. Yeah, that's a good point. It really is a it really is a dirty feeling to have. Um, these communist goons running around <laughs> loose uh, in our state, and uh, you know, with strips well, not strips, but the metal detector in our Secretary of State before he can go into his own office, uh, you know, telling me where I can stand on the state house grounds. Uh, that that kind of you know, just bossy mentality um, from people who are, you know are associated with torture in some cases. Mm -hmm. It it just, you know, um, it it would feel cleaner if they weren't here. Um, For those who don't know, Dave, too, we should clarify the the story about uh, when Hillary Clinton uh, was here um, and and, uh, Bill Gardner, the New Hampshire Secretary of State, had to be checked by her, I guess, her Secret Service. Uh, Yeah, didn't they... um, 
they kind of run the wand over him to make sure he didn't have any metal on him or something before he could go into his own office just because yeah. Hillary was there. And, and that's kind of ridiculous. And there was a lot of outrage. I mean, even, you know, Bill Gardner is a Democrat, but even Republicans who actually, for, I get the impression, generally uh, hold Bill Gardner in, in uh, high regard. They think he's a fair guy doesn't doesn't uh play partisan politics i i guess from from what they say even even a lot of republicans were outraged although of course then it's it's it is an opportunity for them to be angry at hillary and they'll take any opportunity to be angry at hillary but yeah that was a very strange thing i remember seeing a photo of that um and uh yeah that was strange and and i i think it was kind of disrespectful i don't think there's any i don't think any reasonable person would think that uh Bill Gardner would be a threat to Hillary Clinton in any, in any way. Just very bizarre. Yeah, actually, I interviewed him, too, when I was out and about on the 7th. Um, I just bumped into him, and I, I, I interviewed him about what happened. Um, so that will appear eventually on my channel, but I'd like oh. to have a huge backlog of videos that I shot in early January. Oh, good. Plug them all in the air. Yeah, I'd be curious to see that. Uh, I'd I'd ask you what he said, but I don't want to want to I don't want to spoil it. So we'll we'll wait till the uh, we'll wait till the video goes up. <laughs> he speaks. He's so soft spoken that it's fairly difficult to hear what he's saying. Oh, really? Uh, but we did we did talk for a while. So oh, that's um, good. He's he's, funny. he's just he's just so nonchalant about pretty much everything. That's probably why people like him rather than what he actually does and doesn't do. Probably. Well, you got to figure too. I mean, he's kind of seen it all. He's been in that position for quite a long time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. So he's yeah, he's like. Um, I, I also interacted with him in 2008 after you know the, during the Ron Paul primary recount, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you know he was always accessible and willing to answer questions back then too. Um, but uh, yeah, not all not all branches of the government are accessible. And that's another thing I've been dealing with uh, uh, in early January. Is I was I was all over the place, you know, for that three day period, and uh, I tried to do two things I'd never done before, in which a lot of people don't pay much attention to, and that is the uh, the board of education and the board of medicine at the state level. Oh yeah, uh, t tell tell me about that. The board of education actually does get a fair amount of attention, but. Uh, um, I, I, it's just sufficiently out of the way that they don't know how to handle a camera. Does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Perfect storm. So you probably, that's actually already aired. You know, you, you, that's hard. You can just see the videos about that. So I probably shouldn't go into too much detail, but they called the cops on me when I went there and tried to run my camera, you know, outside the, outside the board meeting room. <laughs> so, really? Um, or someone, someone called the cops on me. Uh, and uh, but but what 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 has not gotten any attention on my channel yet is the uh, the board of medicine, which is uh, uh, they've been holding uh, meetings in a locked uh, building. They're they're public meetings in a locked building. Okay. <laughs> now they will let you in. <laughs> you have to buzz yourself in, or you have to request permission to get in by buzzing, and then you're supposed to sign in. And then they, and I had like three, two or three different people come up to me and question me as to why I was there outside the meeting with a camera. So, um, so they call it a public someone came out of the meeting. Someone went into the meeting and informed the meeting that I was there. And then by the time the meeting, which wasn't scheduled as far as I could tell, the meeting, I guess it was supposed to start, I don't remember what time. Let's say it was supposed to start at nine. I get there at eight 30. There's already a meeting going on. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, now, maybe I just missed something, but the public meeting was scheduled to start at a specific time, uh, and I got there half an hour, hour early, and they were already meeting. And then they just continued meeting after right. the public meeting was supposed to start in this secret meeting. Um, wow. And by the time they came out, which they might not have even done, they could have just stayed in there and avoided me completely um, because of the fact that they'd been warned. Uh, some of them did have to come out, and and when I started talking to them, asking them questions, it was obvious they'd all been warned not to talk to me, right? So you see all this, there's just several layers of chilling effect mm -hmm. that occurred because of the fact that it's in a locked building and not used to having reporters there. It's just you know whisper whisper, um, and then don't answer the questions when the reporter asks them. Um, 
So, you know, and they tried to tell me where to stand outside, where not to be, where to be. This is a secure <laughs> facility, blah, blah, blah. No, no, this is a public meeting. I don't care what else you have to tell me. It's a, it's a, it's a public meeting. A right. public, uh, you know, the, the public can walk in and, and, and watch the meeting and do not get in my way when I'm outside, you know, trying to observe that process. Right. Yeah, a, a public meeting in a locked building. Uh, that, that's quite the, uh, yeah, they get to call it a public meeting. And if anyone, if anyone calls them on it, they can say, oh no, it's a public meeting. And you know, but then they, they try to make it as difficult as possible for you to take part. Uh, it's so typical. That's typical of government at all levels. It did, it's a blessing in disguise though, because it gave me the idea, like I'd never experienced having to sign in for something like that before. And I, and, and at the Board of Education meeting, I'd never experienced being, you know, required to wear a badge, right? They yeah. wanted me to wear a badge. So <laughs> ha- having not experienced them, I m- pretty much went along with what they wanted uh, in that regard. But now I have a new idea for, you know, raising hell, uh, and that is just to go in there and refuse to sign in and refuse to take the badge and just, just watch, just get the video of them buzzing around like, like, uh, um, you know, why people are buzzing around. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> they, won't, they won't have first clue what to do. And that's what's so powerful, you know, is, is just, just saying no. You don't, have, you don't have to do that much. You just, just say no, and it just, it just creates the perfect storm in almost every situation. They're not, they're not uh, expecting noncompliance, that's for sure. They're not ready for it. Um, right. Dave, we're, we're actually about out of time on our live window tonight, but please, uh, before we uh, have to wrap up, go ahead and uh, plug the Ridley Report so people know where to find it. Oh, yeah, RidleyReport.com. Oh, that's something, right. You got that little jingle that there. <laughs> All right, Dave Ridley, thank you so much for calling in tonight. And uh, call, like call any time, and, and I think, we've, I think we've, we've established a new trend. This is the beginning of a new trend where you call, and I take the call with no technical issues starting today. A new today. era. <laughs> a new era. All right, Dave, thank you so much. Take care. Thanks, Matt. Bye-bye. Okay, bye. All right, that was Dave Ridley of the Ridley Report. And uh, we are out of time tonight. So uh, we had some more things to get to, which we will get to tomorrow on the television edition of Matt Connerton Unleashed. Remember, you can watch that Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern on IPM Nation. And we will make it available on YouTube and Vimeo later in the day. And we will run the audio tomorrow night at 11 p.m. in this very slot on IPM Nation. And we'll be back Thursday night live on both IPM Nation 1 and OTR-FM. But, uh,